The U.S. Air Force's recent admission has sent shivers down spines globally. They have acknowledged creating something so advanced, it has the power to unravel everything we know. This admission has not only sent shockwaves throughout the defense community, but has further fueled curiosity about what lies ahead for military technology, and the question everybody is asking is, what feature does the mysterious technology possess? How will this technology impact the future of military strategy and global peace? Join us as we unravel the mystery behind the United States' mysterious next-generation technology. The statement made minutes ago by the U.S. Air Force has sprung up rumors and speculations about the capabilities of this well-kept secret. Experts in military warfare have acknowledged the fact that this best-kept secret is a powerful and potentially dangerous weapon. Some believe the technology is a new type of missile or an advanced drone that is capable of mass destruction in nanoseconds, and others are of the opinion that the United States is working on a sophisticated cyber weapon designed to disrupt digital systems, which would have far-reaching consequences in contemporary military operations. However, given the rise in artificial intelligence AI, some are suggesting that the U.S. has come up with a smart technology that can make autonomous decisions with next-generation intelligence that will alter the natural occurrence of things or the need for man in modern warfare. The United States is, however, working on something called the Next Generation Jammer. This Next Generation Jammer is an exciting development in the field of airborne electromagnetic warfare systems and has been designed to replace the AN-ALQ-99, which is currently used on the EA-18G military aircraft. But what exactly is electromagnetic warfare, and why is it so exciting? Electromagnetic warfare, also known as electronic warfare, involves the strategic use of the electromagnetic spectrum, or directed energy, to control the spectrum, attack an enemy, or impede enemy operations. The main goal of electromagnetic warfare is to deny the opponent the advantage of the EM spectrum while ensuring friendly forces have unimpeded access to it. What's interesting is that electromagnetic warfare can be applied from various platforms – air, sea, land, or even space – by both crewed and uncrewed systems with or without human operators, and can target a wide range of assets, including communication and radar systems, and other military and civilian targets. Military operations are carried out in an information and technology environment that's becoming more and more complex due to the electromagnetic spectrum. This part of the information environment is what we call the electromagnetic environment, or EME, for short. Now, it's recognized that military forces need to have unrestricted access to and use of the EME, and this complex field is divided into three main categories. First up, we have electronic attack, or EA for short. Next, we have electronic protection, also known as EP. And lastly, we have electronic warfare support, which goes by the acronym ES. The first feature is the electronic attack, or EA, which is a fascinating field that involves the use of electromagnetic energy weapons, directed energy weapons, and anti-radiation weapons. These are used offensively to attack personnel, facilities, or equipment to degrade, neutralize, or destroy enemy combat capability. In the realm of electromagnetic energy, this action is often called jamming. It can be used for both communication systems and radar systems. When it comes to anti-radiation weapons, for example, missiles or bombs that use specific signals, they follow that signal directly to its source, leading to a direct impact and the destruction of the transmitting system. The second concept is the electronic protection. This concept involves measures used to safeguard against electronic enemy attacks. It also includes measures to protect against friendly forces who might inadvertently implement a parallel electronic attack on their side. This is sometimes referred to as EW fratricide. The effectiveness of electronic protection is gauged by its ability to counter an electronic attack, so the stronger the EP, the better it can withstand an EA. 
Flares, as you might know, are commonly deployed to divert heat-seeking missiles, causing them to miss their intended target. This is where the concept of flare rejection logic comes into play. It's a technology used in the guidance system of an infrared homing missile, specifically designed to counteract the use of flares by an opponent. This is another prime example of the EP. Now, you might be wondering what the difference is between electronic attack EA actions, like jamming, and EP. Well, while both EA and EP aim to safeguard personnel, facilities, and equipment, EP specifically shields against the effects of EA. This could be EA initiated by friendly forces or adversaries. However, that's not the whole story. EP encompasses a wide range of technologies. This includes spread spectrum technologies, which spread a signal over a wide frequency band for better security and resistance to interference. It also involves the use of restricted frequency lists, emissions control also known as MCON, and even low observability or stealth technology. They are primarily installed on aircraft to shield them from incoming weapons fire. Now this suite of systems can include a variety of measures, and first up, we have the Directional Infrared Countermeasures, also known as DIIRCM. These, along with flare systems and other types of infrared countermeasures, are designed to protect against infrared missiles. They work by confusing the missile's infrared homing head, causing it to veer off course. Next, we have CHAF. This is a type of electronic countermeasure that disrupts radar signals. When deployed, it forms a cloud of metallic strips which scatter the radar waves and make it harder for radar-guided missiles to lock onto the aircraft. There is also the Digital Radio Frequency Memory Decoy System, which is used to protect against radar-targeted anti-aircraft weapons, especially from China. They work by copying the radar signature of the aircraft and creating a false target for these anti-aircraft missiles to track. There is also the Electronic Warfare Tactics Range. What this does is essentially to simulate a practice range designed to resin personnel in the field. It is more like a real-world simulator where they can experience and learn to counter electronic threats. In Europe, for example, there are two of these ranges. One is located in RAF Spadidum, and the other is located in the Multinational Aircrew Electronic Warfare Tactic Facility, which is situated between Germany and France. These EWTRs are equipped with ground-based equipment that simulates the electronic warfare threats that aircrew might encounter during their missions. This hands-on experience is invaluable in preparing them for real-world scenarios. But it's not just air forces that benefit from this kind of training. There are also EW training and tactics ranges available for ground and naval forces, ensuring comprehensive preparation for all branches of the military. Another interesting factor that makes electromagnetic warfare fascinating is the anti-fragile system, which is an intriguing advancement beyond the standard electronic protection. It's a unique phenomenon in which when a communications link is jammed, it becomes more capable as a result of the jamming attack. However, it's important to note that this is only possible under certain conditions, such as in the case of reactive forms of jamming. Now, let's take a moment to highlight a significant development in the field of electronic warfare. In 2021, Israel Aerospace Industries unveiled a new electronic warfare system named Scorpius. This state-of-the-art system can disrupt radar and communications from various platforms, including ships, unmanned aerial vehicles, and missiles. What's more, it can do this simultaneously and at different intervals. Now, we're going to delve into the world of signals intelligence, also known as SIGINT. This is another concept that overlaps with electronic support, or ES, signal intelligence analyses and identifies intercepted transmissions and is divided into electronic intelligence and communications intelligence. When we analyze signals in these categories, we look at several parameters which are polarization, bandwidth, modulation, and frequency. The distinction between these is determined by three key factors, who controls the collection assets, the type of information provided, and the intended purpose of this information. Electronic support 
is carried out by assets that are under the operational control of a commander. The main goal here is to provide tactical information. This includes threat prioritization, recognition, location, targeting, and avoidance. But here's where it gets interesting. The same assets and resources that are tasked with electronic support can also collect information that fulfills the requirements for more strategic intelligence. This means they can simultaneously gather data that can be used for broader strategic purposes. So that is a brief distinction between the SIGINT and the ES and how they work together in electronic warfare. Having discussed that, we can now turn our attention back to the next generation jammer and the history behind it. To better understand the features of the jammer, which are yet to be disclosed, we are going to discuss some of the issues faced by the ALQ-99, a key component in electronic warfare that is being replaced by the jammer. The ALQ-99 has been known to have reliability issues which include frequent failures of its built-in test that have led to situations where crews have flown missions without being aware of existing faults. This is far from ideal, as you can imagine. But the problems don't stop there. The ALQ-99 also interferes with the aircraft's AESA radar. This interference not only reduces the top speed of the aircraft, but also places a high workload on the two-man crew. The United States Marine Corps is contemplating a significant change. They're considering replacing their Northrop Grumman EA-6B Prowler, an electronic attack aircraft, with F-35s. But these aren't just any F-35s. These aircraft would be equipped with stealthy jammer pods, enhancing their electronic warfare capabilities. Back in September 2008, the United States Navy laid out the basic requirements for the next-generation jammer, the NGJ. They emphasized that the design must be modular and open, will have cyber attack capabilities, and will use the ISA radar to insert tailored data streams into remote systems. This means it will be able to disrupt enemy systems by feeding them false information. The ITT Boeing design for the NGJ was quite impressive. It included six ASA arrays, providing all-around coverage. Their design leveraged ITT's experience with broadband electronically steerable antenna arrays. Recognizing the potential of this design, the team was awarded a $42 million contract to further develop it. But ITT Boeing isn't the only player in the field. At the same time, contracts were also awarded to other major defense companies, including Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and BAE Systems. This goes to show the competitive and collaborative nature of advancements in electronic warfare. During Operation Odyssey Dawn, existing jamming platforms were stretched thin across three wars. This led the Navy to speed up the NGJ program. Instead of the previously planned 2015, the Navy moved up its timeline and presumed the selection of a vendor in 2013. Every contractor that bid for the program included active electronically scanned array technology in their plans, which is a major game changer in the field of EW. Initially, the system was expected to be fielded on the Growler by 2020. However, due to financial constraints, the initial operating capability was pushed to 2021. Back in July 2013, Navair announced that the technical development phase of a contract, which was worth a whopping $279 million, had been awarded to Raytheon Space and Airborne Systems. However, things took a turn later that month when the Navy issued a stop work order to Raytheon. This was in response to a formal protest by BAE Systems. Fast forward to December. It was discovered that the Navy had used improper procedures in selecting Raytheon for the contract. Despite this, after examining the issue, the Navy decided to continue with them. Back in June 2014, they had a successful system readiness review and were looking forward to flight testing in September. This meant they were aiming for an initial operating capability by the end of 2020, and by November of that same year, 2014, they conducted a test flight. The pod they were working on operates independently of the aircraft's systems, 
which automatically responds to any threats that it identifies. Now, here's something really interesting about the next-generation Jammer NGJ that Raytheon is working on. Its active electronically scanned array AESAA combines electronic warfare, communications, radar, and signals intelligence. While AESA is known for its EW and radar capabilities, its ability to handle signals intelligence and serve as a communications array are new and exciting developments. And guess what? These pods aren't just for dedicated EW aircraft. They can be installed on other platforms like the unmanned carrier-launched airborne surveillance and strike UCLS with minimal changes. Due to the promising features of this next-generation jammer, the Royal Australian Air Force is making a significant investment in the next-generation jammer program. They're contributing a whopping $250 million and are not just funding it, but also actively participating in its development, which is a clear demonstration of their commitment to advancing this technology. In August 2020, the first flight test of the mid-band version of the Piode was conducted. This test flight took off from the Naval Air Station in Maryland and was crucial in demonstrating that the pod could be safely operated on on EA-18G. Two years later, the mid-band pod achieved its first operating capability, which was a huge milestone, and was followed quickly by an award of a capability block one contract later on. The low-band pods are set to enhance the existing jamming system on the Growlers. This upgrade will continue until the high band, the final of the three increments, is deployed and the older system can be phased out securely. Since this technology is a replacement for the ANALQ-99, let's explore the capabilities of this system. The ANALQ-99 is not just any electronic warfare system, it's an airborne one. It has a rich history, having been previously installed on the EA-6B. But now it's being used by the EA-18G Growler, a military aircraft that's making waves. There's also the ALQ-99E version of this system. This one had a special role as it was carried on the EF-111A Raven aircraft. Its job to serve as an escort or standoff jammer. So, as you can see, the ALQ-99 is quite a versatile system. Now, the ALQ-99 isn't your average system. It's got receiver equipment and antennas mounted in a fin-tip pod. It also has jamming transmitters and exciter equipment located in underwing pods. This design allows the system to intercept, automatically process, and jam received radio frequency signals. Its system receivers can also be used to detect, identify, and directly find those signals. This powerful system was installed on several aircraft models across the U.S. military. Firstly, it was used by the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps on their EA-6B Prowler aircraft. The U.S. Navy also had it on their EA-18G Growler aircraft. The U.S. Air Force wasn't left out either. They had the ANALQ-99 on their EF-111A Raven aircraft. However, these aircraft were retired from service by May 1998. Lastly, the U.S. Navy's EA-6B Prowler, which also had the AN ALQ-99, was retired from active service after its deployment in 2015. In its older versions, the AN ALQ-99 had a maximum power output of 10.8 kilowatts. However, in its newer versions, this was reduced to 6.8 kilowatts. Interestingly, it uses a ram air turbine to supply its power. Now, let's talk about its jamming capabilities. The ANALQ-99 can jam frequencies ranging from 64 megahertz to 20 gigahertz. These jamming frequency ranges are divided into 10 bands, 
we have the Band 1, which has a range from 64 to 150 megahertz. Similarly, Band 2 has a range from 150 to 270 megahertz. Next up, we have the Banks 3 with a range from 270 to 500 megahertz. And the Band 4 takes us from 0.5 to a whooping 1 gigahertz. As we continue to climb, Bands 5 and 6 cover the range from 1 to 1.2 to 5 gigahertz. Band 7 then jumps to the range of 2.5 to 4 gigahertz. Moving into higher frequencies, Band 8 covers from 4 to 7.8 gigahertz. Band 9 continues from 7.8 to 11 gigahertz. Finally, we reach Band 10, which spans from 11 to 20 gigahertz. The NLQ-99 has seen action in numerous conflicts and operations. It was first used during the Vietnam War from 1972 to 1973. It was also deployed in Operation El Dorado Canyon, the 1986 American raid in Libya. In the 90s, it was used in the 1991 Gulf War, Operation Northern Watch from 1992 to 2003, Operation Southern Watch from 1997 to 2003, and the 1999 Balkans War. In the new millennium, it was used in the 2003 Second Gulf War and 2011 during Operation Odyssey Dawn. However, the ANALQ-99 has had its share of challenges. Its reliability has been questioned due to frequent failures of the built-in test, or BIT, which have led crews to fly missions with undetected faults. It also interferes with the aircraft's AESA radar, reduces the top speed of the aircraft, and imposes a high workload on the two-person crew when employed in the EA-18G Growler. It is because of this unreliability that the United States started working on the next-generation Jammer, which is designed to address all the shortcomings of the Q99. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.